This episode is brought to you by the Girl Scouts of Colorado. And before you ask, my answer is Samoas. Well, maybe it's Thin Mints. Okay, sometimes it's those lemon ones. What's the lemon ones called? But the Girl Scouts are about more than just cookies. Girl Scouts of Colorado has opened the first in the nation Girl Scout Dream Lab in Denver's own Lowry neighborhood. There's a STEM lab, bouldering wall, a podcast booth, uh uh-oh, competition, a stage, and a boutique. The Dream Lab is open to anyone. So if you know a kid in pre-K or elementary school, drop in daily for all kinds of STEM, entrepreneurship, and outdoor type activities. Trifoils, are those the weird shortbread ones? Um, Other than that, I love all Girl Scout cookies equally as a former seller. For more information, visit girlscoutsofcolorado.org forward slash dream lab. Lemon Ups, is that what they're called? They're newer. That's why it's like, they're not, I don't know exactly what they're called. I think you're right. Today on CityCast Denver, a whistleblower in a video showing a lock on the door of a seclusion room inside one of our public schools has lit our school district on fire. With less than two weeks until classes resume, the principal is suing the district, and 6,000 parents and counting have called for his reinstatement. Me and Bree are digging into the McAuliffe scandal with a firebrand teacher who just so happens to be running for office. Then, a rousing round of wins and fails. Today is Friday, August 11th. I'm Paul Caroli, and here's what Denver's talking about. Welcome back to CityCast Denver, the show about the city that ranks number seven in the country for weed consumption. That's it? Right? Seven. Didn't you We're expect to be higher? Seven? Seven? Yeah, but maybe this is like the even out as more places legalize it, right? Is that the theory? Well, maybe. I don't know. I mean, is I this- got this on a very trashy website. So the okay. data is suspect for uh-huh. one. Um, I'd be curious if that's above ground legal weed consumption or I mean, if it's that's just really weed the consumption, right? Tim, like, that's a real question. Seven is kind of low. The, yeah. the data is highly, <laughs> highly suspicious. Also, yeah, maybe people still don't talk about it as much as it's open. Like, it depends mm-hmm. on your family or your uh, workplace type. Like, is it okay to talk about? I think it's like alcohol at this point. Mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. it's weird to talk about, but it really depends. So maybe, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe there's some low key smokers. Yeah, Tim, they're hiding. I don't know. Well, you've heard his voice. I'll introduce him already. I mean, Bree, of course, is here. Uh, uh, of course, I'm here. Bree is here. Sorry. And we have a great guest today, a returning guest. Uh, number one, oh, yeah. he's a teacher. But number two, longtime listeners will remember he was on the show a couple of years ago when he spoke out against teacher burnout at DPS right in the middle of the pandemic. Then he was back on the show when DPS conspicuously chose not to renew his contract. And now he's running or angling for, uh, we'll get into some of that complication in a minute, for the state house seat recently vacated by one of our new city council members, Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez. Tim Hernandez, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm hella excited to be here. What's good, guy? Yay. We're excited to have you. We're excited <laughs> yeah, to have you. In person, too. Let's, let's just start with the campaign, because I think people are going to be wondering about that, because that's the news you just announced a couple of weeks ago. Tell us, give a couple of minutes, why, why do you want this seat? So what I'm running for is what's called a vacancy, and it's a, it's a little bit different than just straight up running for office. So it's actually kind of important because um, about 25 to 30 percent of the entire state legislature is not elected via a public election. They're a, a, what's called appointed through what's a, a, a vacancy process, right? So yeah, I you read know, that when, the other day. I was shocked. I was it's, shocked. It's I'm massive. shocked by that. I had no idea. Well. 25 that's, to 30 percent of over all a of the quarter to a third. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And that's that's a. I think it's a democratic question, right? That's that's really seminal there. But so I'm running for the House District 4 vacancy, which is the north side and the west side of Denver, right? It's everything from Regis University all the way down to Morrison Road and Westwood. And uh, I'm running because our uh, our House representative, San Anel Gonzalez Gutierrez, right? She was mm-hmm. our previous representative, wonderful progressive champion for a lot of really important issues and and pushed our, our community, um, you know, in, into a very, very good spot, uh, you know, in, in fighting for really important issues to us. Mm-hmm. She she won a, a city council race. And so now she's our city council at large. Yeah, we'll insert I'm a, like a crowd. Ah, like a, yeah, you know. I'm so, I'm so <laughs> anyway. excited. She was my representative and now she's our city council person. Yeah. So. And so uh, what that creates is called a vacancy. Vacancy. And so mm-hmm. basically the way that it works is Serena's resignation went into effect the first week of August and the Democratic Party of Denver, or according to state statute, the political party that won the seat in the last 
primary mm-hmm. election, right, or, or in the last full election and holds the control of the seat, runs what's called a vacancy. And we have 30 days to put somebody and elect somebody. Otherwise, Jared Polis gets to pick whoever he wants that lives in the district. Wow. Only 30 days, too. Why I'm curious, though, that you're taking this route because, I mean, I really think of you as like a people's champion in terms of like, I could see where you would be great at rallying voters. Mm -hmm. How does this, why did you choose this route when you have to sort of deal with the establishment? Well, I I, I kind of concur with what you're saying, right? My politics and, and the way that I was raised are not institutional politics. They're, they're much more grassroots, right? My, my family are Chicanos. We've been in the neighborhood for a long time. And, and a lot of my politics have always been rooted in grassroots, right? And directly with students and communities. But it's, it is also a really influential process in how the Democratic Party builds power. And I think that a vacancy committee is not a particularly democratic process. And I think that it should be things like a public election, a special election even, right? But because 25 to 30 percent of our state legislature is appointed via this way, the budget note on it is giant. And so this is the way that we run the process in Colorado. And I became involved because I wanted to make the process as democratic as possible. I wanted to bring as many people to the table that, look, if this is what we've got and we can't get to a publicly funded election, a special election, then I want to make sure that we can expand the table and that our community can be as involved as possible in this process. And so hmm. that was really important to, to, to the way I want to merge my politics with with like how you do, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and how, also just how you work, operate in the world, like you said, as a grassroots organizer, as someone that starts with people, mm-hmm. not just with power. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, in the interest of expanding the field and engaging people, we will be sharing links to some of your opponents, some of their positions. Yeah, yeah. A couple of really interesting women. I have to say, one of them was she had to leave the legislature because of an allegation that later proved to be false. It was mm-hmm. like she was exonerated. So mm-hmm. that's that's one of the people that Tim's uh, Tim's up against. That is one of yeah. one of the folks that I'm running against. Correct. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I I, I uh, wish 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 you the best of luck on this, Tim. But yeah. we want to talk to you yeah. about something else that's come up in the last few weeks. Um, but honestly, we have a little bit of business first. Sure. Bree. Okay. We had a conversation with Denver Post reporter oh. Megan Lulani Boynton on Monday. On strip, the strip about clubs. strip clubs. Yes. Mm. Uh, and someone on the very cool and very fun CityCast Denver subreddit responded to that episode <laughs> and pointed out that when we were speculating about uh, regulations of strip clubs, we were talking about state data. We did not talk about the city's tracking of this industry. Of like how many there are? Mm-hmm. How many there are. So, so does Glendale track this? I should... Oh, man, mm. that's another good question. I should talk to Glendale, too. But I checked in with the, my, my friend at the excise and license department for, the, for Denver. They are very helpful there. Just want to give them a shout the out. Best. The <laughs> They're best. always good at answering our questions. But the data on Denver strip clubs is interesting. There were six back in 2020 when they started tracking this. We have four now, and it had dipped down to two. So okay. we went. We lost two thirds. I mean, it numbers this low. It's, what kind of trend are we even talking about? But lost two thirds of our strip clubs, and now we're back up. So maybe the data bears out what Megan was saying, which was Perhaps, nationally yeah. the strip club scene is dying, but in Colorado it's doing just fine. Yeah, cool. Isn't that interesting? Hey, I'm glad I, the numbers. Sex work is real work. You oh know? God, huh? Oh God. So, <laughs> um, anyway, so let's get to our main story here because um, this is a doozy. We, we're going to need some time to to pick this apart. We got to start on August 3rd. This is a week ago. Denver Public Schools Board uh, Vice President Ayante Anderson revealed that he had received a tip from a whistleblower at McAuliffe International School. They alleged that Principal Kurt Dennis, who had just been fired over other issues, had overseen a seclusion room with a lock on the door (sighs) for students to be inside. We've been dealing with the fallout ever since. It's honestly a shockingly complicated and nuanced issue, in my opinion. Um, But Tim, you're a teacher. I am. What's your first reaction to this? Um, My first reaction is I I believe it. You believe the in the existence of this seclusion room, not not just in the existence of it, but in an educational philosophy that warrants Mm. it. Right? There's there. I I think you know to be honest, uh, and and we'll get into the the nuts and bolts of things, right? But I. I think um, it hits me in a really raw place because I don't think that education should be a side of carcerality. And I, I, I think that's my my truth that, that we'll probably come back and forth to. But I think when we treat children, you know, um, in, in carceral ways, then we, we, we often forget 
right? That the school to prison pipeline begins in the classroom. And that means that the way that we treat students does directly support or deconstruct a system of a prison industrial complex that does start in schools. And so to me, you know, it's, it, it is, I, I, I automatically, you know, say, yeah, a, a school would do that. And I think more than being a teacher, but I think being a participant in our culture and our society, I, it, it really does kind of make my stomach turn um, because I, I think it really reaffirms a cultural notion that I think adults kind of like to punish children. And I think adults hmm. culturally um, do, you know, really resort to, to, to punishment instead of rehabilitation. And, you know, wherever that place comes from, or we can unpack socialization or what have you, but, you know, it makes my stomach turn because um, I, I think that oftentimes in education, we assess and, and, and accept the possibility of creating a different world, right? And when we're locking students in a room and watching them through a window as they have mental crises, right? That's reminiscent of the current world that we live in about how we treat people who undergo mental crisis in community. Mm. And I think that um, when we when we uphold an unjust world, it, it does make my stomach turn as an educator, but as a community member, it makes me question, you know, are we actually changing anything? Are we actually doing anything to create a different, you know, system and version of reality? Hmm. That is such a fascinating perspective. That reminds me of this uh, educator I spoke to a few weeks ago on the SROs issue. Mm -hmm. This is a person who was for SROs, aka cops in schools. Mm -hmm. um, and she made this point that I just haven't been able to stop thinking about throughout this whole McAuliffe affair, which was schools are a microcosm of society. Everything mm. that's wrong with society is in schools. Oh yeah. So why, why would we be so surprised about a seclusion room when we have jails, when we have these things for adults? Well, and like you're saying, Tim, I thinking about adults punishing children um, as just a way we do things in the mm -hmm. world. Um, as a parent now, learning about gentle parenting and understanding like even when things are really bad and my kid is acting out of control, mm. how do I respond in a way that is affirming of his experience and not punishing, but like learning and giving him space to have that reaction. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to not just be like, go to your room or like spank him or something. You know what I yeah, mean? Because yeah. those are our natural reactions. And now I'm thinking about it in this school setting and it's like, yeah, why are we do, we know this doesn't work. We, we know, and we, we know, know it, it harms children. Yeah, we, and, and like you were saying, Paul, right? Like I, I even say, I don't think schools are a microcosm of society. Schools mm -hmm. are a reflection of society, right? Schools and, and everybody always talks to me about gun violence in schools and what are we gonna do and how dang, schools experience gun violence and gun violence is an issue in schools because gun violence is an issue in society. It is not a microcosm, it is a reflection. And so, you know, when we know that our society often practices, a, you know, solitary confinement and throwing people into the hole. And, you know, oh. like that, that is a cultural way that we have decided to handle harm in our society. Mm -hmm. I am not surprised nor caught off guard by a, a version of society that reflects that exact same practice, right? Like, I, I'm sure we'll get into it, right? They, they discovered in this room that there were multiple holes in the drywall and they had to put repair requests and they quote, it is quote, due to student rage and incarceration. Why are we putting a kid in that position in the first place? I have an answer for that. Okay, All right. please. Here's, let me bring some nuance to <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, because why are we doing this? Why? Some people like it. Mm. Here is a quote from a parent of a student at McAuliffe who has experienced this room. The quote is, our son has battled with emotional dysregulation his entire life mm. as a result of multiple medical and developmental diagnoses. He is a funny, loving, and inquisitive boy with an occasional tendency to escalate quickly and intensely in certain situations. Unfortunately, becoming physical, which could place him himself and others at risk. He mm. hates feeling out of control. And when this happens, he appreciates having this designated space to deescalate and eventually return to feeling himself. Hmm. You know, I, I actually, I, I affirm what folks feel when, when we read about an experience like this. I, I think there are two nuances to pick out, right? I've worked in a school with what was called a rumination room. It was not a de-escalation room, nor, nor, you know, folks are calling it an incarceration room. It was a room, you know, filled with soft furniture and music and candles and, and you know, all kinds of, they even had like a, what is it, essential oils, right? And and ways to offer de-escalation to young people, right? Because I think that there is a humanistic notion, right? A, a, a self-regulatory notion that, that the parent is speaking about, that mm -hmm. this is a space that their young person can go and self-regulate and practice the skills of self-regulation. The question becomes, right, 
Is that a space that works on a mass level of students? Should it be an institutional practice? Should it be a policy, right? Even though it might individually benefit one student, and I have worked with effective needs students, right, who do have physical outbursts, who do sometimes escalate to the point of violence. I, th I still think that there's a really important notion to unpack that this is not, you know, a, a soft, gentle space where the student is, is, you know, just walking into and then they can leave whenever they want. It is a space that they are told to go to, that they are taken to and observed by adults outside of the room, right? Like it's a, a and locked inside. It's a pun. It's a the punishment. Yeah, right. There's a it's there's a, a punishment, <laughs> and that's yeah. the other thing though is this parent that we're hearing from uh, clearly was aware. Mm -hmm. From what I understand from other reporting, some parents weren't aware their kids were being put in there. Hmm. And Which, I know that yeah. that's like, they. It, I don't know if there's clear data on that, but like, that's where me as a parent is like, I go into freak out mode if I find out something happened to my kid at school. Like if that's mm -hmm. happened to my kid, I would lose my absolute mind. So it's frustrating to me. I understand and empathize with this parent, but what about the parents whose kids they didn't know were have, having this happen to them yeah well and, and it's even further exacerbated right because you know kurt dennis's lawyers come out in the press and said dps should be thankful and he's he's the principal at mccall yeah yeah, yeah that yeah, was, yeah, fired. The, was the, fired the principal the that was fired for instituting this room right it says dps should be praising kurt dennis for using the de-escalation room instead of calling the police it's like those are the only two options. Those are not the only two options right? that exist. It is not an That's option where we lock me. where we lock a student into a room and and tell them to be quiet and then they can come out, right? Like what are we teaching children when we lock them into a room and while they're in the midst of crisis and say, "Well, as long as you calm down and you can be quiet, you can leave." Right? How, that that doesn't that does teaches that submission. Them? That teaches yeah. compliance to power. That does not teach self-regulatory skills. That does not there there is no right like you're describing Bree, there is no prerogative you know, of students choosing and voting that this is a policy that they want for themselves. This is a policy that adults come up with to identify and remedy a problem. Mm -hmm. And what we're being pitched with, right, according to Kurt Dennis's lawyer, is that it's either this or we call the police on them. When I think there's also a really important way to unpack the idea that students are not inherently violent. There's nothing inherently violent about a young person, regardless of whether they are, you know, are identified with a disability or not. But there is systems that are unequipped to handle the experiences of our young people when they do reach violence. And I think that when we're only pitching it of, well, it's either a de-escalation where we have to call the police, that's not accurate either. I, as a teacher, have de-escalated students, right? There are restorative practices that we can train each other on. There are There's a lot of other ways of policy yeah. that exists that this is not fair to nor inclusive to. Yeah. Let's talk about policy a little bit more. Yeah. Dennis has responded. Now he is kind of emerged as this main character in this whole thing. He was fired. We'll talk about that in a bit. That's a part of this, but kind of a tangent. So the, Den the Denver Post talked to Dennis this week. He reportedly denied that he violated district policy, calling it a de-escalation room and said that the district doesn't give principals like him sufficient guidance on how to manage a room like that. He says there was a window in the room so he and others could keep an eye on the kids. Now, DPS policy is that there has to be an adult in the room yes. with the kid. And the door cannot be locked. And the door can't be locked? It cannot be locked. That is the policy. Well, what do you what what was what did you think about that response, Tim? You you know DPS. I do. And I don't think that Kurt Dennis is inaccurate in saying that the district does not provide adequate training on how to implement restorative practices in their schools for school leaders. I will say that as a teacher who worked at North High School, right, where we were told repeatedly North High School is a beacon of restorative justice practices and we are the most restorative justice school and people are coming from all over the country to come and see what we do. And, and then in the school day to day, we were not doing restorative practices. We were criminalizing and surveilling and policing students. Um, specific to the policy in DPS, right? The the seclusion, right, is, is the mm -hmm. word that DPS and it bans seclusion rooms, right? And that's a policy called JKA-R, um, right? And, and it was revised in 2019. And it's important to understand where it comes from because it came from a, a, a very, you know, well-known case um, of Brandon Pryor's child. In case you don't know, hmm. Brandon oh. Pryor is a parent in DPS who's been very outspoken and done amazing grassroots organizing to Wasn't push DPS. Wasn't he like DPS. banned from campuses? Yes. Yeah. And then successfully parent. won in court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah no, but I'm Brandon sorry, Pryor's ahead. son um, experienced an impact of seclusion where he was handcuffed. <gasps> and in 2019, right, DPS reinstituted and redid their seclusion policy to say, look, we are not going to be handcuffing children on, on campuses and seclusion rooms are not allowed. 
Now, a de-escalation room is what Kurt Dennis is positing as something different, according to the way that 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 special educators have called for de-escalation. Right, that there there sometimes are students that have effective needs or students that just reach a level of escalation that does become violent. But I think that there's a really important fundamental policy question, right? Of you can label a room, whatever you want to call it. And if it's systemically and according to the policy that exists functions exactly in the same way as something that is banned in the district, then we could call it a call fruit, it whatever you uh, want. We could call it a sunshine room, right? We could call it's it a, still functioning as this. Exactly. That if you're locking a student in there, there's yeah. a lock on the door and there is a, only a window for adults to observe as a student undergoes crisis, right? There's also like a really important question about, yeah, maybe DPS didn't train you if you were not trained effectively on how to institute this in an effective way to the point that you engage with students and merely watch them from outside the window, that tells me that you weren't trained because anything in restorative justice practices says that you need to go and directly interact with somebody who is escalated, right? That de-escalation does not happen from behind a locked door and a window observing, right? That is not de-escalation. Meeting somebody it, where they are exactly. versus reinforcing those power dynamics by saying, I'm out here watching, I'm surveilling you. Exactly. That's so, not restorative justice. Yeah, of course Kurt Dennis is not trained effectively on how to do these things because the way he's practicing this is not even in line with restorative practices that are ratified in DPS, right? So of course he's not trained. The question becomes, right, this is a, a question that, that kind of always happens in DPS about school autonomy, right? About what can individual leaders decide for the needs of their schools, right? And this was a choice by Kurt Dennis that mm -hmm. like we have to remember not every school comes with a built-in seclusion room. That's not how it works. Kurt Dennis chose to implement this and in fact, put it in a former school psychologist's office <laughs> where there was a mental health professional to de-escalate students. Has been replaced with. Was replaced with a room where we locked lock the door and watched a kid have a violent outburst through a window, Ooh. right? Like <sighs> That breaks my heart thinking about that kid. I just, I'm thinking, I went, I'm a student of DPS. I think about the moments that I had where I was I was being picked on mm. at school and I had a teacher that let me hang out in her room mm. and like just be with her if I was feeling picked on. And mm. it, I think it probably helped me a lot in ways that I didn't think about till we're talking about it just now as an adult that was like, hey, I'm I'm here for you. Mm. I'm sorry that's happening to you. I'm sorry I school is stressful and that one girl will not leave you alone, but you're safe in here with me. Mm. And she, that was not approved. I know she didn't have, you know, I was just in there if I didn't want to go to the class I was supposed to go to. Yeah. And it's because I had a teacher that was an ally. Yeah. And I just, I just can't imagine what this feels like for these kids that have been, because that's the other thing I'm thinking about is post this, this kid will, this will impact children's lives forever, that they've Absolutely. been locked in a room by someone in a position of power who's supposed to be in charge of them, that their parents have said is okay to be in charge of you. Then I took a safe parenting class. The number one rule is don't put your kid in a room with a, a stranger with the door locked or like, like it just like doesn't, none of this makes sense to me as a parent. I want to add another wrinkle. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. So Kurt Dennis, the principal, he's an interesting guy. You know, some of the reason why this whole thing happened was this whistleblower was upset about a previous and recent incident. So Kurt Dennis, he had been fired after he appeared on Nine News. Mm -hmm. In March. In March. Yep. Right after the, the shooting at East High School, two administrators and the 17-year-old student did die by suicide. And so here's what Kurt Dennis said to Nine News that got him fired. I knew there was a chance. It made me sad that this was the outcome, but uh, not surprising. When students come back to the halls of McAuliffe next month, the only principal the middle school has ever known will not be there to welcome them. I'm mad, sad, frustrated. Kurt Dennis. I'm a lot of things. I'm worried. Cannot even email his staff and parents the news. I've, I've been disconnected from all district communications and, and no longer have access to uh, any type of communication format to speak to my community. This week, this letter arrived in his mailbox, terminated, ineligible for reemployment. Why? An interview he did with us in March, an interview in which he told us DPS had forced him and his staff to perform daily pat-downs of students accused of, among other things, attempted murder. It's not our job. We're not trained to do it. Um, there are no guidelines or guidance on how to do it properly or do it safely or where to do it or when to do it. Other school leaders told us off camera the same thing. They were terrified of having to perform daily pat downs of potentially dangerous students. Students like the one who shot two deans at East High earlier this year.
if we listen to what Kurt Dennis is describing, right, um, I think that Kurt Dennis, you know, and maybe possibly his heart of hearts is hoping to to raise the the consciousness of of how discipline is working in Denver public schools at a time where we are very publicly being asked what our safety procedures and guidelines are. But I still think that the common thread that I hear between this is that a student who, you know, has experienced a social condition that has led them to, you know, things like charges and 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 things uh, and incidents of violence, right? Um, an adult in a school is viewing them and revealing that private information about their lived experience to a, a press outlet, right? Which is why he was fired. He was not fired for speaking out and whistleblowing. He was fired because he revealed information about a student that he had information that, that he could have only accessed through DPS systems. And that's illegal. You can't do that. But what I hear the common thread being is that we view students, at least folks like Kurt Dennett, um, that, that there are a lot of adults who work in schools that view students as something as inherently violent and that we cannot do anything about, that we need to keep them out of schools and we need to keep them away. I think what the common thread that I'm trying to pull and really raise to the surface is that there are a lot of adults who work in schools who do not see children as people, who, do, who don't really view children as a human being who does experience rage and anger and yes, violence, violence is a part of all of our lives, right? And that means that our job is not necessarily to tell somebody that they're violent and so they should never come back because they were violent once. Our, our job, right, as adults who work with all young people in a public education system, our job is to serve all capacities of our students. And just because a student has experienced violence or perpetuated violence does not mean that they should be cast away or thrown away. I, 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 I think that's the common thread that I hear is that Kurt Dennis views children as violent beings who he must respond to and mitigate as a data point in, in his job. And, and I don't view children that way because I view children as people who remember things and who have lived experiences. That's exactly what struck me, honestly, was how he talked about kids. At the beginning, I empathize. Yes, it should not be a teacher's job to pat a kid down I do, or an administrator's job. I don't love that thought either. I don't love that this is what our kids have to go through to get into school or that our teachers are put in these positions where they're already not paid enough, let alone they're having to be security. But the thing that really struck me was how he views children. And if that person was the head of my kid's school, I would pull my kid out of there immediately. He sees my my child as a potentially violent person. I don't know. That quote was so telling to me. I'm like, that's the problem right there. He doesn't view children in a positive way. It's important to remember that Kurt Dennis is one person making the news in education. I can tell you there are people in nearly every school in Denver public way. schools who see kids this way, right? That and and let's layer on an added fact, right? Eighty-seven percent of the people who work in Denver public schools are mm -hmm. white, whereas majority, fifty-three percent of the students, you know, are brown. And and predominantly, you know, most of the schools in every district in the state of Colorado are increasingly making up students of color, which means, right, that if we view Right. Students of color is inherently violent people who must be responded to, locked away into a room, expelled from a school and not allowed to attend a public school anymore. Right. What what educational condition is that creating? I would ask Kurt Dennis directly. Right. Why do you feel comfortable instituting policies that criminalize students that don't look like you? Right. What what world are you building to, Kurt? What 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 how in what ways are you dismantling the school to prison pipeline? And what ways are you advancing racial justice by villainizing students who don't look like you oftentimes? And, you know, who who also, regardless of race, deserve the opportunity to become the people that they are supposed to be. And that is not a hundred percent violent, regardless of how many violent instances a student has at school. All right. Well, I think we have to leave it there. Obviously, there's a lot more to talk about with this issue and the story's not over. Um, there is still a petition gaining support. 6,000 parents have already signed uh, calling for Kurt Dennis to be reinstated. So yeah, we are going to be talking about this more. Um, but right now we're going to go to a quick break and then we're going to come back and do wins and fails. This episode is brought to you by the Colorado Wine Board. Because the wine community here is so much more than you might realize. We've got Bigsby's Folly and Infinite Monkey Theorem, sure. But there are urban wineries all across Denver and the Front Range. And oh my God, it's almost Palisade peach season. 
But did you know that Palisade is also home to some of the best wineries in the state? My producer Paul visited one year and will not shut up about how awesome it was. Colorado wineries produce all sorts of wine, so finding a label you love is easy no matter where your adventure takes you. Discover it for yourself and support local winemakers at coloradowine.com. Hey, this is Paul dropping in before we get to our wins and fails with a content warning. Breeze Fail is first and includes depictions of self-harm. I recommend skipping ahead a few minutes if you think that's what's best for you. All right, and we're back. Uh, we're going to do our new... Uh, it's not new anymore, it's Paul. It's not new. <laughs> We've been doing it for weeks. Wins and fails. We're doing wins and fails. It's not new anymore. No. Now it's just... Mile highs and my lows. My favorites. Yeah. Why don't we call it that? That's better. Mile, Mile highs and lows. I feel like That's I pitched sick. that and you shot it down. My, I'm here to advocate specifically from mile highs and lows. You well, got to. Maybe I changed my mind. I like that. <laughs> All right. Who wants to go first with their mile high low? Their first low. Mm. I mean, mine goes right off of what we're talking about, which is the carceral system beginning with school and continuing to punish people with mental health issues. Um, I apologize too in advance. This is a really graphic story. Um, uh, Boulder County was uh, Boulder County has to pay two point five million to a man who gouged his own eyes out in solitary confinement. Um, he was in solitary multiple times. He was picked up. He was he was unhoused at the at the time or transitionally housed. I'm not sure, but he was picked up after getting in a fight on the street with another gentleman, and he had schizophrenia. And um, I think because of that, he was not treated at a hospital as he should have been. He was put in solitary confinement, which I cannot imagine being a worse thing to do to any human, let alone somebody in crisis. As we've just been talking about, locking a kid in a room alone when they're having a crisis, locking a human being in a space where they can't even see other human beings for days. The first time he was in, 33 days. The second time, four or five, he doesn't remember. The 17th, the, the third time, I believe, the 17th day, he um, blinded himself permanently. Um, and also he was in that solitary confinement for hours after his incident with himself before they even bothered to take care of him. And again, I just think about being a parent and thinking somebody let my, this happen to my kid in a place where like, why is he in jail? Because he has schizophrenia. Like I just, I just cannot imagine. And so, they interviewed his dad and his dad was like, how much money is enough to to give my kid? Like my kid can't get his sight back. So is two point five million dollars enough? Like ask your 30. I mean, this kid, this guy's in his mid 30s and he has to live this way for the rest of his life. But I just it just made me think about this story. Like, why are we why are we still doing these things to people? We know there is, I don't think there's ever been good data about solitary confinement. They have studied it at length. It is harmful for one day. It's harmful to a person. Some people exist in there for years. And I just, I just what a, what an absolute fail of society that we let this happen to somebody who has a mental, who has a mental, who's having a mental health crisis, who has, I've, mental I'm on drugs for medic I'm I have depression like if I was not being treated I don't know what would happen to me and so I just really think about this gentleman and his family and I just want people to think about that when you think about punishing somebody what it means what was this gentleman's name his name Ryan Patridge he's 37 years old wow. and yeah. solitary confinement man Ended, yeah, as, ended. ended as a human practice, ended on an institutional level Absolutely. for kids, for adults. It is not effective. It is not, if it would have stopped the amount of harm that we think is going to stop, it would have, right? It is it is I mean, an archaic practice and it is a vindictive, violent one. And I'm and so it, sorry It ruins that story. people's lives. Yeah. This guy's life could be totally different if they had put him in a hospital instead of putting him in solitary confinement in jail. Because mm. he was doing something on the street. You know, mm. so well, Ryan, we'll be thinking about you. Sending yeah. the family lots of love. Yeah, and absolutely. 
Um, but we uh, we should go on to our next mile high low. <laughs> Tim, would you like to go next? Or, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, can... I, I got roller coasters, and that's okay. kind of fun. That's a different... Uh, we'll, uh, where, where does I'll yours land? Yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. That's you go fine. Ahead. Mine, my, we'll do like a spectrum. Yeah, of, I know. I was like, sorry, I started lows. out real no, no, heavy. But... No, look, I, I think I, I want to name, like before I share what I have to share, like mm-hmm. there is a really important, you know, way that we have to sit with the lows, right? That yeah. we, we have to paint them for what harm they are causing to our society and absolutely you know, i think especially getting emotional over harm in society is, is a human response and we should all be responding from that human place when we hear issues of this you know and 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 you know heartbreaking stories like that and i'm uh my loss my mile high low is that what it is is that what it is yeah wow. mile high low yeah. mile high low <laughs> my mile low uh <laughs> <laughs> my below sea uh, level is <laughs> did you guys hear uh about uh the federal judge uh his name is philip a brimmer um philip a brimmer he uh, officially blocked this week sb 23169 which would have raised the age to buy a gun in colorado yeah. to, to 21 years old and he issued, uh, you know, he, his statement and, and, you know, has, has said that, uh, you know, that the law was actually, it, it, it was, it was a good law, right? Like it, it would have created a misdemeanor for people under the age of 21 buying guns, but it also would have created a misdemeanor for gun sellers selling to people who are under the age of 21. Um, but folks with the Rocky Mountain gun owners uh, oh, uh, are yes. supporting the suit. And, and in case you don't know, Rocky Mountain gun owners have been fighting any good gun violence prevention in Colorado and in places is all over the country for a very long time. Uh, their stance is the right to bear and keep arms includes the right to acquire arms. Um, they specifically cite cases in Florida and Virginia that um, bans where, where bans on people under 21 buying guns, they, they've been struck down. Um, but I think that there's a really important way, you know, in, in lieu of what we were talking about earlier in the state legislature, this is why we need bold gun violence prevention legislation, right? We should not be questioning, oh no, the federal government is not going to pass an assault weapons ban. What We can't pass it in Colorado. When we are passing common sense gun violence prevention legislation now, folks in our communities, are still working to prevent them, right? And I, I think, you know, there, there's a there's a really important nuance that that Judge Brimmer he's also handling the case uh, for the three day waiting period uh, that that came up, and and folks are filing injunctions, you know, for the three day waiting period. But he denied Rocky Mountain gun owners their injunction over this law because, quote, there is no imminent injury from this law. There's no imminent injury from making folks wait three days to buy a gun. The question I would ask Judge Brimmer is, what imminent injury exists? for people under the age of 21 for not being yeah. able to buy a gun, right? What injury exists for folks under the age of 21 not able to purchase a firearm? Yeah. Why is this common sense gun violence prevention legislation? Why is this the case that you stop, right? That more young people should have access to guns. It takes so much work to try to get there only to have it undone. Exactly. Well, it's feel- incremental progress, I think. That's the optimistic take is like, you know, the legislature's back in session in the spring. They're going to have another shot at this. Maybe they'll write a, a slightly different wording in the law. You know, here's the here's the even more positive spin. Last time the Democrats in this state passed gun reform legislation, there were recall movements. I haven't heard of a single one for one of the Democratic legislators who passed true. the mm-hmm. bills that we're talking about right now. That's very fair. That's very fair. And I think I think there's also a really important notion of, you know, I, I believe that that change can be incremental, too. And if we know that we are already going to have to fight judges once the law's already passed, why would we only half step? Yeah. Right. Why would we not just pass the legislation we know is going to save lives, regardless of whether a recall movement comes or not, right, to prevent people from dying from guns? If we know that part of the increment that we're going to have to work against is the court and legal system, right? Mm. It is not just fighting other legislators. We need to pass the bold legislation with the democratic trifecta of government that we exist in right now. We need to push our power, we need to push bold democratic policies like gun violence prevention legislation, like common sense gun laws, because when we part of the the way that that incremental change is going to be limited is by a system that is not within the legislature. So the legislature's role is to be as bold as possible to save as many lives as possible. All right, okay, it's my Paul, turn. It's your turn. We're talking about roller, roller coasters, coasters for a few some, minutes. Bring God some damn levity it. to the other side. <laughs> All of right, this. come on. What we got? The cyclone is still closed at Lakeside. Uh, That's the fail. It's been closed for like a year and I hate it. Uh, 
I got a I season pass to Elitch's. I rode the new Twister 3. I loved it. It's a mm. very competitive roller coaster. <laughs> what is it called now? It's, uh, <laughs> it's No, it's Storm Chaser. It's Twister 3 it's... colon Storm Chaser. Storm Chaser. Oh, it has a yeah. colon yeah. in the yeah, name. Yeah, there's a Popeye's I, sign brave. in the the like rafts underneath. It's That's a good coaster. Have you two rode, rode Twister? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that's in a, a long yeah. time. That's I a pretty do good like one. At, I don't know how it is now, but when it was Twister 2, you had to sort of walk through the wooden, mm -hmm. like yeah. the coaster. You still have yes. to. Do you? you? I love yes. that. I it's very that. cool. Yeah. When I was there with my wife, Megan, she was like, this was the thing. This anticipation yeah. of like winding through and seeing it come over top of you. And yes. Anyway. Wait, wait, wait. But Lake's is closed at Lake. The yeah. cyclone's been closed. I Try called it. them this week. They were... The, they were okay on the phone. It's like if not super like nice. I was kind of Trey Parker a little bit worried. and Matt Stone situation out there that wants to buy Lakeside but doesn't want to screw over the employees. <laughs> I would love to help you make that dream yes. my my dream your reality with your money. <laughs> <laughs> I want to buy Lakeside and turn it into a public park. <laughs> yeah. And restore all of its buildings. Like a Coney Island, right? I love yes. That idea. Well, yes. No, like even past that. Like imagine like a communally owned and operated Don't like this is there's a Lakeside dream for steering years. committee. Yes, we are, we are. Public roller coaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we will never close the twister. <laughs> Thank you. So Paul wants to publicly own roller coaster. But I just want, I just want the sliding scale community space that anyone yeah. can use and housing okay. on it. Okay. You know, yada yada yada. Well, Tim, you might be in the legislature next year. We'll talk again. Yeah. Then. You know, maybe we'll get something happen here. Roller coaster policy. Uh, keep, keep your eyes peeled. Paul's people's coaster. <laughs> All right, so, so uh, we got to keep moving on here. Um, Normally, I would call this the winds, but these are now these are now the mile high highs. <laughs> these are the mile high peaks. These are the fourteeners. These mm. are the fourteeners of this show. Okay. Yeah. All right. Shall I start? Yeah, go Come for on. it. Paul. Yeah, okay. let's run a bit. I've got one. I, I don't know how this one's going to go over with this crowd, but I thought this was really cool. Oh, jeez. <laughs> This is a real Paul. Denver's, an <laughs> Denver's Department of Public Safety, which oversees things like the fire department and the police, has rolled out over the course of the last few months a series of new transparency measures. Oh. And I think that's awesome. It's a dashboard of information, mm -hmm. um, and the new ones are related to police fire emergency medical service response times, and it's mm -hmm. broken down oh, by district. Yeah. So you can see over time, and it's tracked, when the response times for 911 calls are very long or how mm. just how long they are. Yeah. That's what it is. It's just about putting the facts of how the city works out there so they can be more accountable. And mm. this is apparently, uh, uh, it's not even a Mayor Johnston move. This has been happening for months under uh, Mayor Hancock's appointee, Armando Saldate. Mm. Um, so I, I just think this is a, a big win. I think that's a great program, a great priority for the city. He says he wants to do more. He's called on all the departments under him to think about what data could be public. Hmm. Transparency is key in a just society because people that don't want to be transparent are doing things that they don't want us to see. So mm -hmm. that's a great sign, Paul. Yeah, uh, I might, does. I'd be skeptical of who's collecting sure. that data. There's, there is a citizen board. This is another Hancock okay. development. There's a citizen agency. I don't have the name down, but I'll, I'll post links in the show notes. This is an interesting issue, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's a start. I, I take your point. I totally take yeah. your point. But it is a start. Well, and I think there's, there's, it is really cool. I do like the idea of starting with public reporting specific to, you know, you know, institutions that are municipally funded for public safety. Right. Right. I also think, you know, like, yes, co let's collect data on the response time. Right. And I would be curious about, you know, how do they respond in Montbello compared to Southeast Denver? And then I would, I would advocate that it shouldn't just be for response time. It should be types of calls, right? It should be all kinds of different publicly available data. Which right? I feel like we're going to get to because the STAR program and the co, I want to say, I met a really nice woman who said, you need to talk more about the co-responder program, which is mm -hmm. similar to STAR, but it's not STAR. And it's, I think it's bigger, but at any rate, those um, entities can function better when we have the data to know this many mental health calls are coming in from Montbello. So we need to send more co-responders out there or mm -hmm. this many, you know what I mean? Like different neighborhoods getting different needs met. All right, let's move on. Um, uh, Bree, how about you? You want to go next? Yeah. So um, Denver bought a bunch of porta potties. Hmm. We aren't just <laughs> renting them. Yeah. Hmm. We bought them. And we're Honey out. buckets. Honey buckets, which we is the that. grossest name for a toilet. That but is a tough name. They're 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 buying it's them okay. so they can they can know. outfit them with um, hand washing stations and sharps containers. Nice. So used needles can go in safe containers where nobody gets hurt by them. Mm. Which I think is if you're that person and I hear you out there, you hate seeing hypodermic needles in the street and blah blah blah. Support this. This is a way to get those 
out of the public space. I agree they're unsafe. Drug users would tell you that they are unsafe. So I also love this. I love this for many reasons. One, the city is finally, and this is the new administration, as well as the work by city council over the last 10 years, not just this new council, to say, People need public restrooms, and these are not going to be public as much as they're going to be parked kind of by encampments. But that's the other thing we hear. People are pissing on the street. There's poop on the street. How do you solve that? You give somebody a bathroom. Here we go. So yeah, we go. Honey bucket. I am just love that the city is making these steps. It feels too little too late for a lot of folks. For me, it's like whatever. It's who doesn't need a bathroom right now? They're going to be used immediately. My hope is that this pushes our city to invest in public restrooms, mm. permanent public restrooms. Absolutely. But these are a great start because public restrooms uh, are very expensive to build the infrastructure for mm. plumbing and whatnot. So let's be supportive of uh, honey buckets outside of encampments because it means needles are out of your neighborhood and pee is not in your neighborhood anymore. Mm. Great win. Yeah. Cheers. I great like win. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tim? You're up. Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my mile high, or yeah. what, is that what it is? Yeah. I don't, I'm That's trying what, to, mile absolutely. high, high, and <laughs> mile high, high. high, high. My win, my mile high, is the new renter laws that went into effect in Colorado this week, in case you didn't hear. Yeah, yeah. I just saw this on I didn't, Instagram. I didn't hear. I just What's saw up? It What's on happening? Instagram. Yeah, there's, a, there's, some, there's some good new renter laws that just went in, into effect. It's, it's important to, to ground us, right? Uh, about 50% of Denver are renters. One in every two people rent in Denver. And half of all Colorado renters are cost burdened, right? Which means that we're spending, folks like me, right, who is a renter and I'm cost burdened, are, are spending over 30% of our income on rent, right? Folks like me, I, I spend over 50. Yeah. But uh, the renter laws that went into place are, are good laws that are going to do good things to help renters. And so one of them that that went in was uh, HB 23 uh, 1099, which is uh, applications and background checks, right? Which means uh, that this allows for screening reports, right? When you apply to an apartment uh, to be applied for 30 days. And so you cannot be recharged for a background check if you apply to multiple apartments. You cannot, you know, things like applications. It's like a one-time mm -hmm. application. So if you're looking at probably 10 apartments, mm -hmm. you don't have to apply 10 times. Yes, I right. Love it. And what's great is if you are not, uh, if your landlord is not following it, there are fines for your landlord uh, and they hold the liability so for, for not upholding that. So that's hmm. really good for applications. There's also a great one, HB 23-1095. Um, shout out to Stephen Woodrow and, and, and Mandy Lindsay, good folks. Um, uh, but they, uh, it's a new law that prohibits um, and outlaws certain things in leases, right? So now your lease cannot have a waiver of a right to a jury trial or litigation. Right, you have the right to a jury trial and litigation, uh, and joining class action claims as a renter. Uh, it is illegal for your landlord to include a fee uh, to a renter that stems from an eviction notice. So you cannot be fined specifically just for being evicted. Right? It, it outlaws evictions based upon solely unpaid utilities, which is really great too. Right? So um, it's doing a lot to unpack and prevent the way that leases are yes. designed to predatorily lead towards things like eviction. Um, and then the that. third one I, I, that that came into effect is income requirements. In case you didn't hear this is a huge one. Um, this is SB 23, uh, 184. Shout out to Lorena Garcia uh, and, and, and folks like Meg Frolic. But this caps the amount that landlords can charge for security deposits to two times the rent. Yeah, because I saw that in looking for, I was helping my brother look for a place and sometimes yep. it would say the security deposit was three times the rent. Yeah. So if yeah. your rent was two thousand a month, you had to pay six thousand up front. I was yeah. like, what is this, New York City? Like that's insane. Well, and like this is gonna so be a cool. great law to help folks like me, right? I'm yeah. I'm a public school teacher. I'm a, the first person in my family to, birth family to get a college degree. I got my degree so I could come back to Denver and be a teacher. I rent in the neighborhood that I grew up in. I pay fifteen hundred dollars a month for a one bedroom apartment, right? And my teacher salary is about twenty nine hundred dollars net a month, right? And and I now that I've taught for a couple of years, it's above that. It's about like 31, right? Uh, but it's about $3,000. And that means that quite literally, right? I if Half if, of your half of my immediately yeah. is gone but it meant for things like my security deposits i couldn't even live in certain places that were certain incomes i couldn't even apply because i would just be wasting my own money and so you know making sure that that renters have a a, a good fighting chance to be able to at least get into leases and at least have you know applications that are not taxing them and and leases that that are enshrining things that are renter rights are important the one caveat i'll give to my win is um these are all prevention 
housing laws, right? They prevent landlords from doing exploitive things. And I think that there is still something that, you know, when, when I when I win in, in about 16 <laughs> days here, um, I really, you know, I want to work on laws that are responsive to the needs of people who are being evicted and who are being charged insurmountable amounts of rent right now. Yeah. Not preventing landlords from further exploitation, but protecting renters as they are right now, right? My win is is any renter law that, that comes into effect to protect renters in the state of uh, Colorado and specifically in in the Denver and shit, even more specifically in the north side and west side, you feel me, is, uh, is a win for me. All so. right, well, we've gotten back Go to renters. your uh, hypothetical future district um, that you're angling for, Tim. <laughs> and I think we have to end the show right there. So if you, maybe you could take a second to tell people where they can learn more about you and then and we'll say goodbye. Yeah, uh, my name is Tim Hernandez. Uh, I'm a Chicano, uh, I'm a teacher, and I'm a north sider. Uh, I'm running to represent the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, that I still live in, and that I taught in. You can go to my website, timforco.com, um, and you can peep my social medias, underscore Tim Hernandez on, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, but, you know, more than that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, if you if you you know ever want to get, get in touch with me, you can reach out to CityCast, and I'm sure I'm, I'm more than happy to, we'll connect to, to, <laughs> to, to connect with people, you know, one-on-one in, in 3D, too. Sure. Awesome. Well... Good luck with that, Tim. Um, seriously, wish you the best. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Bree, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, this was fun. Have a good day. And a programming note for you listeners, we're not doing our weekend maybe, not just because our Peyton's newsletter out. editor, Peyton, is out of town. But In because, Jamaica going wild. Yeah, we got, we, got, we got big things coming to the show soon. We're changing mm. some things up. So uh, exciting cool. things to come. Stay tuned. All right. What's up, weather fam? Happy Friday. I hope everybody's had a good week. It's time to talk some Colorado weather. And a few tidbits of information this week. We have a couple of wildfires burning across the San Juans. Remember, everybody, the western slope and the San Juans in the southwestern area of the state under drought conditions. So please be uh, careful if you are up in the high country, recreating especially in that area of the country. And bundle up. Bertha Pass on Wednesday morning woke up to a temperature of 16 degrees for what it felt like. It was a chilly morning across the high country. We also potentially have a new state record for the largest hailstone ever measured. This was measured uh, in near Kirk, Colorado at 5.25 inches. The current record stands at 4.8 inches for the largest hailstone. So more information to come on that, but that is a big hailstone. This weekend's looking pretty nice across Denver and the Front Range. A couple isolated showers both Saturday and Sunday. Overall, it shouldn't be an extremely wet period, but have that rain gear handy, especially if you're going into the mountains. That's all for the week here on CityCast Denver. Our producers this week were me, Paul Caroli, and Olivia Jewell Love. Peyton Garcia and Adrian Gonzalez write our morning newsletter, Hey Denver. Bree Davies is our host. Our music is by Los Mocachetes, with additional mixing by Tyler Lindgren. If you haven't already, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, follow us on Instagram at CityCast Denver, and tell Kurt Dennis about us next time you see him. You can sign up for that daily newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. See you next week. <laughs>